It's a pleasure to welcome uh, today Professor Arthur McDonald, um, Nobel Prize winner in 2015 for measurement of neutrino properties. He will uh, uh, speak about uh, neutrino properties studies with small and slow blasts and also about uh, dark matter. So Professor McDonald received his PhD from uh, um, Caltech. Caltech, yes, no, <laughs> Okay, Caltech in a, a Kellogg Radiation Laboratory, which was actually funded and directed by William Fowler, who's also a, a Nobel Prize winner for study of the properties of the star related to nu nuclear physics, nuclear energy production in the stars, and which is actually related to the topic of uh, today's talk. And then he was uh, 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 worked at the Chuck River than uh, Chuck River, which is uh, a, a laboratory more or less like Saclay in Canada, a kind of equivalent to Saclay in Canada, and then uh, worked at, uh, was a professor at Princeton and finally was a spokesperson at, uh, of the SNOW uh, experiment. And uh, having said that, I think I leave the... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. It's really a, a pleasure to be uh, here today and speak to you. Um, let me see, maybe this volume is a little high, a bit of feedback. Okay, great. So I'm going to try to cover a lot of, uh, a lot of things today because we've been, we're active in a, in a, a number of areas, uh, particularly uh, at uh, Snow Lab, the uh, laboratory that we've been able to develop, uh, building on the original uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory and expanding the total underground excavation by a factor of three or so uh, to house a number of other experiments, many of them in, uh, uh, in uh, study of uh, direct detection of dark matter, but also uh, we're rehabilitating the uh, uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory to be Snow Plus, which, which is being used predominantly for uh, uh, the study of neutrino with double beta decay. So I'm going to try to cover a lot of those things. I'm also uh, uh, going to try to point out to you the way in which, you know, by having a laboratory two kilometers underground, it's uh, along with China as uh, the deepest laboratories in the uh, in the world. You can study things uh, that otherwise you do not have accessible uh, simply simply because you can get rid of the backgrounds that otherwise would give you problems in your experiments. Uh, and in this case, the laboratory is ultra clean. It's a class 2000 clean room throughout the entire laboratory. So you start from a very good basis to create clean experiments. This is the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory that I'll speak about first. This is the deep experiment, uh, dark matter experiment with liquid argon. And <clears throat> really you can study things that cover the whole spectrum of our universe from the most microscopic in the sense of learning things about fundamental particles through studies of the sun, which uh, will feature in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, studies of uh, our galaxy, and in fact, large scale structure in general, which is where studies of dark matter come in. And in fact, with liquid scintillator in our detector, we'll even study neutrinos uh, from the Earth. And so you're studying geophysics of the Earth in the process. Um, but overall, you're attempting to get information that uh, gives you a, uh, a feeling for how our, our universe was created and how it uh, evolved. So I'm going to say a few words of a more general nature because I realize that, or at least there's the possibility that not all of you are physicists or, in particular, particle physicists uh, in this discussion. And uh, so, I mean, you can study things like how does the sun burn and create the the uh, elements from which we're made, which was actually Willie Fowler's main contribution. Uh, what are the basic laws of physics for fundamental particles? What's the composition of our universe? How has it evolved to the present time? And in the process, you do that by studying neutrinos, things that penetrate through the two kilometers of rock above us, or dark matter particles that also uh, penetrate similarly. Uh, and uh, you can study uh, situations where you have a very rare process and want to get rid of all those surrounding uh, uh, radioactivity. And neutrinos, of course, are one of the three basic building blocks, along with electrons and quarks. They are the 
uh, basic particles we don't know how to subdivide any further. They come in three flavors. And the standard model uh, in its original formulation had them as uh, particles with zero mass uh, and not changing from one flavor to another. Uh, they only feel the weak force. Therefore, they only stop if they hit either the electron or the nucleus of an atom head on. And so they can travel through the distance light travels in a year of lead with only a 50% chance roughly of hitting something and stopping. And so they're very uh, deeply penetrating in terms of our underground laboratory. On the other hand, they're very difficult to detect. And so our detector was the size of a 10-story building in order to be able to observe one neutrino an hour from the millions of neutrinos uh, uh, per square centimeter that are coming from the sun and striking our detector. We were actually able to show that they do change their flavor and the implication of that is that they have a finite mass. And that's of significance in the standard model which uh, has been so successful everywhere else. Of course, the most famous recent uh, uh, discovery at CERN is the, the Higgs boson, the final element of the standard model. But of course, uh, we are dealing with matter made of up and down quarks, three of them forming neutron or a proton, and electrons that surround uh, this particular uh, uh, set of uh, quark and electron components to make up our atoms. Uh, neutrinos, of which there are uh, one neutrino per type, possibly a fourth type, but certainly in terms of active neutrinos, electron neutrinos associated with reactions that involve electrons and muon neutrinos similarly uh, created in pairs with, with muons and so on. And they're produced uh, in substantial numbers in the uh, reactions that power the sun and in certain forms of radioactivity, particularly beta decay. And so uh, uh, they're very unlikely to affect you. You may uh, have one neutrino uh, stop in your body in your lifetime, uh, but unless you have your uh, eyes closed and it happens to hit you right in the eyeball. And very often eyeballs are closed by this point in my talks, but uh, uh, you might see a little burst of light in that case. Otherwise, you'll be completely oblivious to uh, uh, the existence of neutrinos. And dark matter particles are, as far as we know, something that doesn't fit anywhere into uh, this uh, formulism. Perhaps they're so massive that we've never seen them in any of our experiments because we haven't had enough energy to do it. So let's start with um, the sun and the fact that there is a tremendous uh, flux of neutrinos coming from the sun uh, due to the nuclear reactions that power it. Those nuclear reactions uh, give you a spectrum of neutrinos in terms of numbers on this axis and energy on this axis that are shown here. Uh, and uh, this comes from the nuclear fusion reactions that power the sun. Now, back when we started this experiment, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, back in 1984, there was one measurement only, this measurement here with chlorine. It was showing about a factor of three lower number of neutrinos than what was predicted by calculations by uh, people like John Bacall and others. Um, that discrepancy had persisted. It was 1984 that we started. And uh, other experiments started around the same time, such as the Super Cambio Candy experiment, uh, and later uh, experiments involving uh, gallium that were looking for the lower, lower energy neutrinos. But when we started, there was a discrepancy. And, and, and the question was, was that discrepancy due to the fact that the calculations were incomplete uh, or incorrect? Uh, or perhaps the experiment, but uh, uh, was that the problem? Or was it possible that the type of neutrinos, the electron neutrinos created in the sun, were in fact changing into other flavors before they reached the Earth, and therefore not uh, observed in the previous experiments, which were either exclusively or predominantly sensitive to the electron type neutrinos? But in 1984, Herb Chen, who was a professor at the University of Irvine, California, um, proposed that uh, uh, perhaps uh, if you had enough heavy water, and it was known that deuterium was something that could be used to detect neutrinos in several ways, but 
his proposal was if you could get enough heavy water to, uh, to, to make measurements from the sun, and that represented uh, uh, something like 1,000 tons of heavy water to get that signal at about, uh, uh, at about uh, one neutrino an hour, uh, then you might, in an appropriate experiment, uh, deep enough underground, be able to do the experiment. And so it took us from 1984 until 1989 to uh, get the money to do the experiment, but we almost immediately got agreement from the Canadian government to loan us this 1,000 tons of heavy water worth $300 million for a dollar, which is uh, not too bad in any uh, economic circumstance. Of course, we had to pay a million dollars insurance every year in order to keep it, but uh, uh, that was a, a very good starting point. And, and uh, we also had a mining company that was willing to allow us to use uh, what was one of the deepest mines in North America, uh, two kilometers down, uh, to do the experiment. International Nickel at that time, and now it's owned by a Brazilian company, Vale, uh, the way things go in that industry, and uh, they're also being very cooperative with us on our underground laboratory. So the idea here is that if you have deuterium that has that extra neutron in the nucleus, then you can measure two things. The first one being something that is rather specifically created only by electron neutrinos, and that is a situation where the, the neutron is changed into a proton and a fast-moving electron, and in a water Cherenkov detector, in this case a heavy water Cherenkov detector, you can observe Cherenkov light uh, and get a measure of that reaction. The second reaction, which is what makes this rather unique, is one where uh, the neutrino, any neutrino type, electron, mu, or tau, can break apart the deuterium, leaving a free neutron in your detector. And we had three different techniques for observing those neutrons as we went through about uh, uh, eight years of, uh, of operation of the detector. If you compare those two reactions, then you don't need to have a model of the sun in the first place to determine whether the number of electron neutrinos is equal to the total number, in which case they aren't changing, or whether there's a discrepancy in the electron neutrino channel compared to the total number. But you have to be extremely careful because any gamma ray striking uh, the deuterium, which has an energy above 2.2 million electron volts, is capable of doing the same thing. And you get the same signature, a free neutron in your uh, detector. And so we had to design a detector that was ultra clean, keep all elements of uh, mine dust out of the detector, uh, as well as uh, one that uh, had this uh, capability. And we were able to do it. We could. We purified the heavy water uh, to the point where there was one radioactive decay per day per ton of heavy water in the center of the detector. And so it's about a billion times purer than typical tap water. And in that circumstance, and, and with controlling everything else, including the construction, um, you ended up with a detector where the background was uh, factors of three to 10 lower than the signal and was able to be measured with significant accuracy so we could get a good measure of the second reaction. And so when we come back to this figure of uh, neutrinos as a function of energy from the sun, what we find is that for all neutrino types in the three different phases of our experiment, you have agreement with theory. In other words, the sun is putting out the number of neutrinos that are calculated, which is in itself an interesting topic for solar physics. But in addition to that, the measurement of electrons only is significantly lower. Uh, by the time we were finished, uh, about a seven standard, seven or more standard deviation indication that neutrinos are changing their flavor before they reach our detector. Actually, the, the Super Cameo Candy experiment, which is looking at the elastic scattering of neutrinos off of uh, the electrons in regular water, has a small sensitivity, about 15%, to the second reaction here. Uh, and so, in fact, our first measurement back in 2001 was a comparison with the Super Cameo Candy measurements in which we could get a three standard deviation effect 
but by the time we did the full experiment in 2002 and also measured the neutral current reaction, so-called, the one sensitive to all neutrino types, that we had a 5.3 standard deviation effect. Uh, in other words, the, the, the particle physics standard is equivalent to one chance in 10 million. So all neutrino types matched standard solar model prediction. <clears throat> Only about one third showed up still as electron neutrinos and the other third had changed to uh, <clears throat> the other two types. This is what we built. It was built two kilometers underground in a, uh, in a very active mine. They're still taking 5,000 tons of ore a day or so out of the other side of the shaft we, we use to transport things and to travel up and down. We travel with the miners. Uh, but it's, it's fine. We were able to go through a, a construction of this uh, uh, detector without uh, problems, and we continue to do the same thing for experiments in Snow Lab. The heavy water is held in a very large acrylic sphere, largest ever created at that time. It's 12 meters in diameter, created out of 120 pieces of acrylic that were bonded together in place. They are looked in, uh, that, that volume is looked in on by 10,000 well, almost light sensors. They're uh, 20 centimeter in, in diameter. Uh, with light collectors surrounding them, and uh, they look at the central volume and don't see uh, background light from other, other surrounding regions because of the way in which the collectors are set up. This is suspended in ultra-pure light water, which is in a cavity which is 34 meters high and 22 meters in diameter, and uh, uh, which is filled with uh, ultra-pure water. Uh, the uh, Water in the middle is purified to roughly a part in 10 to the 15th or better uh, uranium and thorium content. And the surrounding water is 10 to the 14th in here and 10 to the 13th outside. So it's, it's very high purity. And that worked very well and served us in terms of restricting radioactivity. We made the whole laboratory a clean room right from the point at which we finished the excavation. Coated the walls with this. Uh, with, with materials that enable us to keep it clean. Everybody took a shower and, and uh, uh, put on lint-free clothing, and therefore we were able to get this class 2000 uh, condition. Uh, we estimated, by making measurements carefully, of the amount of mine dust that was on the detector, that it was less than you could pile in your thumbnail, less than about one gram of dust on the entire detector, which was necessary in order to be able to do the experiment. And so, we had three phases of the experiment. In the first case, we had pure D2O. In the second case, we put in some salt, which enhanced the signal uh, from the neutrons and enabled us to do uh, a uh, uh, determination of the second reaction from the first one based on the isotropy of the events. And then finally, in the third phase, we put in about uh, half a kilometer of very clean alpha and, well, helium-3 detectors, which when you capture a neutron, emit uh, a, uh, a triton and a, and, a, uh, and a proton and give you a clear signal. You can see the detectors here as they're actually rods that are uh, extending within the, the neutron volume. And uh, they were very successful in giving us a totally independent result for the third phase, and all three was, uh, results uh, agreed with each other. Uh, this nice yellow submarine, what other color would you pick for a submarine if you had your choice, right? <laughs> We'd all like to live in a, in a yellow submarine. That's what we picked. It turns out that yellow paint was radioactive as hell. <laughs> we had to strip it all off, and so we had this prosaic underlying green submarine that was could only be driven by somebody who was under about 23 years old. None of us old folks had the, the ma manual dexterity or the video game skill to be able to do it. So we've got uh, uh, these things being floated into place with the submarine in this 300 million bucks worth of heavy water. And it all had to be done by young people. So uh, they did it great. <laughs> uh, and, and, and there's the list of their names. 
uh, we had uh, altogether about 270 people on the project, and in terms of uh, Nobel Prizes, they only give it to one person, but those are the people that really actually did the work and, and, and earned the Nobel Prize. So uh, very proud to have been associated with them. So that's the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, and, and uh, uh, the reason for the prize was, in fact, the discovery that neutrinos do change from one flavor to another, which is a new property of, of neutri neutrinos and something that requires you to change the, the standard model in a, in a very fundamental way. So let's talk a little bit about what we know about neutrinos and, and where we're going in the future in terms of measurements of neutrinos. Uh, first of all, the, the, I mean, the essence of what it is that is happening here is that uh, you have uh, these electron, mu, and tau neutrinos created in events that are associated with electrons, mu, and tau. They are the so-called flavor states that are created in the first place. And they are uh, quantum mechanically related to three mass states. And these are the, the eigenstates of mass represented by colors here that uh, show up for the, the three different uh, uh, flavor states. And as the neutrino, for example, is created as an electron neutrino, it travels through space, or in some cases through matter, in which case there can be an interaction. Um, and as it does, these uh, uh, fractions of, of the uh, different masses change. And so when you do a detection and ask, whoa, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> As you do a detection and ask what fraction of what you've observed looks exactly like each of these combinations of colors, you find that in fact only 30% of the time does it look like this, and, and the other 70% uh, or so it looks like some combination of the others. So if you write it down, and particularly write it down in terms of uh, three neutrino types, then in quantum mechanics you would express the eigenstates of flavor in terms of a matrix times the eigenstates of mass. Here's the matrix. Uh, Pontecorvo, Maki, Nakagawa, and Sakata matrix is the term that's usually used. Um, and it turns out this matrix breaks down in terms of various combinations of parameters. For oscillations, the combination of parameters is everything to the left of this point, but it's the same matrix that relates to the predictions for neutrinoless double beta decay. And in that case, there are a couple of other phases that come into it, but I will mention it again when we come to discussion of neutrinoless double beta decay. Now, these are all cosines or sines, called mixing angles, uh, of things called mixing angles. It turns out, it, it, it's very interesting, it, it breaks down the way things have turned out into um, measurements of those matrices that can be done with different uh, energies of neutrinos and different distances for the experiments that you're, that you're looking at. Because Fundamentally, in a vacuum, you end up with something which is proportional to the difference in mass squared, either mass 2, 3, or 1, 3, or 1, 2, times the length over which the neutrino is traveling and divided, divided by its energy. And so that gives you the ability to measure these parameters in atmospheric or accelerator experiments, uh, which is what was done first at Kamio Kande. Uh, these parameters in solar, uh, at snow, or reactor at uh, uh, Camland and other uh, places. These in <coughs> accelerators uh, uh, like uh, T2K or reactors like Double Show or Dia Bay or Reno. And in fact, these angles have all been defined by these measurements. Now, a big question, however, is whether this CP violating parameter is finite or not, in order to understand overall uh, whether, you know, what the properties of neutrinos are, but also because uh, one of the most popular theories of how we end up in a matter-dominated universe is the fact that neutrinos are involved and that other heavy 
right-handed neutrinos are involved and that they violate CP in their decays. And so there are major experiments like uh, Dune or Hypercamiocandy, Hyper Candy, who are looking to measure this, uh, this parameter. Uh, and so uh, uh, a lot of the parameters have been defined, but not all at this point. Uh, it turns out that if we have a significant CP violation in the neutrino sector, it may be an understanding for how all the antimatter decayed in the early universe. Now, if you take the snow result and combine it, in this case using nuclear models, with all the other measurements that have been done in a very beautiful way by the other experiments you saw on that plot, um, you see that uh, that analysis, including an effect called the mckayoff smirnoff wolfenstein effect in the sun, where the interactions with the dense electrons in the sun perturb the, uh, perturb the uh, oscillation process, and in fact it's a slightly, it's an adiabatic process, that essentially starts with a with an electron neutrino in the sun that becomes a mass two, almost complete eigenstate leaving the sun, and it stays in that state till it reaches the Earth. It determines that mass two is greater than mass one. It determines the difference in mass, and it determines the mixing parameter theta one two. And so for the sun, you have that information. There's many experiments now that have been done since then uh, that have shown oscillation patterns. You don't see an oscillation pattern in the snow experiment. You simply see the flavor change. But in the original observation of, uh, of an oscillation in the Super Kamio Kande experiment in 1998, this is an oscillation pattern that you see. Uh, the Camland reactor experiment uh, has shown oscillation that actually is related to the one, two parameters. And in accelerator neutrinos, you see here T2K, but also in those reactor experiments I mentioned, including double shell, uh, you see a oscillation that is sensitive to the one, two parameters. So why should oscillations and their existence relate to having a finite mass for a neutrino? Well, it turns out that if, uh, in order for neutrinos who are traveling through a vacuum, this is only applicable in the vacuum sense, if they're going to have the ability to sense elapsed time in their re rest frame in order to then go through this oscillation process, they can't be traveling at the speed of light. So if they're not traveling at the speed of light, they must be slower than the speed of light, and they must have a finite mass. And so oscillation in a vacuum, per se, implies that the observation of that requires you to have a finite mass. And so finally now, in terms of summarizing where we are for the overall parameters for neutrinos, uh, this is what the particle data book gives you right now. It gives you a parameterization in terms of the difference in mass squared and the angle theta any one of those angles, one, two, one, three, two, three, and so on. And what you see is that, first of all, for the two, three parameters, there's a combination of the definition by a super K in the first place, now added to by Minos and, and Nova and Ice Cube, which defines that parameter quite well, but doesn't determine whether or not it's, it's maximal, whether it's uh, one in the tan square, you know, in, in, whether it's tangent is one, or in this case, its sine is, uh, is a half. In the case of the solar and the reactor as measured by Camland, uh, then you see that there is a good definition now in this region right here of the fact that the angle, which is defined actually predominantly by the snow measurements, and the difference in mass, which is defined primarily by the Camland measurements, are very well defined and clearly non-maximal. This is uh, many standard deviations away from uh, point, uh, point 0.5. For the one three parameters, there's been kind of, whoops, <laughs> pardon me, where am I? For the one three parameters, there is 
measurements by Dyer Bay, by Reno, by Double Shell, uh, T2, T2K, uh, which are up in this region in terms of the 1-3 uh, parameter. And it is also uh, very well defined these days. And our objective overall is this delta parameter, uh, which is something that will be uh, looked at uh, as a, an ongoing measurement. Dune or Hyper-K uh, will study that. Uh, the intention there is to have an interaction, in this case, with the matter in the Earth rather than with the uh, uh, matter in the Sun in order to observe CP violating effects that would indicate that it's finite. But there's a whole series of other things that we don't know yet. We don't know whether a neutrino is its own antiparticle, so-called Majorana particle, which is what is addressed by uh, neutrino that's double beta decay. We don't know what its absolute mass is, which is also addressed by neutrino that's double beta decay or by endpoints of, of tritium beta decay, such as the Katrin experiment. We don't know the hierarchy, which is the question of whether mass three is larger than or smaller than the other two neutrino types. Uh, we don't know whether this parameter, in fact, is maximal. And there are also uh, experiments, a variety of them, that have indicated that there might be a fourth neutrino type known as sterile neutrinos, including uh, measurements done uh, with double show. Those are the things we don't know about neutrinos, but it makes for a very healthy and active uh, set of experiments in the neutrino sector. I'm going to switch now to uh, dark matter detection, but I'm going to try to put it in context of the implicate of how it how it is related to uh, the, the evolution since the Big Bang. And it turns out neutrinos also come into this. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, I'm sure you've, you've heard the, the standard Big Bang theory that, uh, well, now it's about 13.7 billion years ago, that there was a major explosion followed by a super fast inflation, at which point you're left with the very basic particles and their antiparticles. Uh, essentially equivalent amounts of both because you started with a creation of these matter or mat and antimatter particles from pure energy. And then as it cools off, uh, the quarks are able to uh, clump into protons and neutrons after about a microsecond. And then after three minutes, uh, then uh, uh, that's the point at which light can shine through this uh, residual material from the Big Bang. And that's the point at which you get cosmic microwave background information. And then, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, I got that wrong. Uh, that's uh, 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 after about 300,000 years. You, you have electrons combining with protons and neutrons to form atoms. And uh, this is when light can, can, can shine through. But eventually you end up with small density fluctuations coalescing to form galaxies and, and uh, smaller clumps forming the first stars after about a billion years, and that has continued to the present time. But there are a couple of questions. I mentioned one already. Where did all the antimatter go? There's also the question of uh, what's the absolute mass of the neutrino in terms of its influence on how structure has formed, and that's where dark matter also comes in because it has a major impact on how structure is formed, and we think it makes up about 26% of the total mass uh, energy of the universe. Let me mention Snow Plus first before we go into dark matter in detail. In, the, uh, in this day and age, uh, recycling is a uh, very big topic, and uh, so this is kind of the ultimate in recycling. It's a $70 million roughly experiment, and uh, so uh, we're reusing it by replacing the heavy water in the middle here with linear alkyl benzene plus fluor, which gives you a very good liquid scintillator. And then we're going to load that liquid scintillator with about four tons of tellurium. And tellurium is an isotope that has uh, a very good opportunity to observe uh, neutrinoless double beta decay. Uh, it turns out there's an isotope of tellurium tellurium-130, which is about uh, well, more than 30% of the total. Right now, the detector is filled with light water 
and it is running and we're just about this September to put the liquid scintillator in and then next year to put in the tellurium. So neutrinos double beta decay is a process where the neutrino is its own antiparticle. And therefore, in the case of a nucleus like this, tellurium-130, where you are energetically allowed to emit two electrons, and you can also emit two neutrinos, which gives you a continuum like this, just like for single beta decay, you can have a situation where if they are a Majorana type particle, no neutrino is emitted because neutrino is emitted and reabsorbed as an antineutrino, and no neutrinos come out, in which case it's monoenergetic if you sum up the energies of the two electrons. And so <clears throat> a number of different experiments using different isotopes are proposed. The lifetime for that process is proportional to nuclear matrix elements, which are difficult to calculate, but which are known to factors of two to four at this point, a phase factor, uh, including Coulomb effects, and a uh, effective mass parameter, which is made up of those same angles and differences in mass that are actually the masses themselves that I showed you earlier in terms of oscillations. So it's possible now to make a prediction of what you might expect to see for a given value of the absolute mass in this case, as opposed to just differences in mass as observed in the process of oscillation. So <clears throat> present limits are in this vicinity here. Uh, this is fractions of, this is a one electron volt. Uh, 40 milli electron volts or 0.04 electron volts is actually uh, the value of delta M for atmospheric neutrino oscillations. And if you have the inverted hierarchy, you might expect the sensitivity to the lightest neutrino mass to follow this curve. Similarly for uh, the normal mass hierarchy. Uh, but uh, at the present time, the experimental limits are here. We're hoping to get down into this region with um, the uh, Snow Plus experiment. That's what our projections show. But you must note that uh, actually 0.1 electron volts here implies a lifetime of 10 to the 26 years. So you have to have a lot of material and very low radioactive background in order to see it. This is what we project for that value, uh, 0.1 electron volts, uh, in terms of the signal you would see from uh, the uh, neutrino as double beta decay compared to the background of two neutrinos of uh, uh, radioactivity from the uranium chain and, and other sources. And so that's what we're projecting to start observing in 2019. Uh, in the future, it's possible to load another factor of 10 beyond the 0.5% tellurium that we're putting in at that time and to improve our phototubes, in which case we might be able to do uh, much better than, than the sensitivity I showed you. So let's talk about dark matter. Through a wide variety of astronomical measurements, it's possible to uh, conclude that uh, the total mass energy balance in the universe is about 26% dark matter, only about 4% of the type of matter we're formed from, and 70% dark energy, which is inferred from the fact that if you measure the uh, supernova that are at the farthest distances you can observe, with a supernova of a type that they're kind of a standard candle, and you can determine their distance by determining how much light you get from those supernova, and then you can determine how fast they're moving based on their redshift. That enables you to say that, in fact, there has been some acceleration to the universe. In other words, Einstein's original equations do not simply result in an attractive force for gravity, but a small repulsive force as well. And that has been expressed in terms of a quantity known as dark energy, which if it is a correct expression, results in essentially closing the universe 
uh, with a total, ma uh, total amount of uh, mass energy uh, summing up in this way. Now, <clears throat> this uh, uh, dark matter, I, for a long while, thought it was thought perhaps to have been neutrinos, but the masses we've observed for neutrinos are so small uh, that it's inadequate to explain uh, the various uh, uh, sim signals that we have in astronomy for dark matter. And there's also, of course, an attempt at the LHC, a very valid attempt to produce such dark matter particles for the first time since the Big Bang with the premise that they are so massive that uh, we now might have the energy to do it. The evidence that we have for dark matter takes a wide variety of forms. Some of the predominant ones are the fact that if you plot in a spiral galaxy like this, similar to the Milky Way, if you plot the velocity of, uh, uh, of stars in the, in the outer region and all the way out to the outer region and compare it with what you might think the, the uh, velocity would be just based on how much mass there is in the glowing stuff, you find they're too fast. They would not have taken that orbit that you observe. And there, unless there's five times as much not glowing matter holding them in place. And that's the, one of the first origins of dark matter. Large scale structure requires, its formation according to models, requires uh, slow moving, uh, massive, uh, weakly interacting materials or uh, weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs, uh, the is the term that's usually used. They haven't been observed at CERN, but they're postulated by a number of different uh, theories. And so it's still a puzzle. So, as I mentioned, one of the principal objectives of a number of the experiments in our snow lab, in fact, is the direct observation of such dark matter particles by allowing them to bang into a nucleus and recoil. And there are various techniques that are used to try to uh, understand that it was a dark matter particle or a nuclear recoil as opposed to another form of ionization that might cause, for example, a electron recoil, which is what radioactivity has a tendency to do. This is a greater detailed picture of the, the new part of the laboratory, uh, snow over to the left here. And uh, the set of experiments that exist there uh, is shown here. And uh, there are many of them that are involved in dark matter measurements. Uh, I'm going to tell you about, particularly about the deep experiment with uh, liquid argon. There are other experiments, PICO, and super CDMS that are using, in this case, supersaturated gels. Uh, in this case, uh, 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 germanium detectors where you measure bolometry as well as ionization. And then the news experiment, which uh, Gilles Verbier, uh, who is now at uh, my institution, Queen's University in Kingston, and also people here, are working on uh, developing a very nice symmetric uh, a spherical detector with a very low threshold uh, capable of observing very light mass WIMPs. So Snow Lab is uh, quite a nice laboratory. You can see the floors are clean. Uh, the cavities are large and uh, there's lots of room for uh, future experiments. I'm going to speak first about the deep experiment involving liquid argon. Uh, collaborator from Can collaborators from Canada, Mexico and uh, UK and Germany involved in that. Basically, we have about three tons of liquid argon contained in a large, very clean uh, <coughs> acrylic sphere. It kind of looks like snow, actually, if you <laughs> don't get into the details. In this case, <coughs> 255 room temperature phototubes looking in at the central volume through light pipes made of acrylic, with the intervening space filled up by uh, uh, hydrogen-containing uh, uh, plastics, uh, so, that you, so that the neutrons produced by alpha-N reactions out here are thermalized before they get in the central volume. We're counting uh, with about uh, 3,000 tons. We, we have a small leak up in this vicinity that leads us to not fill the whole thing. 
but uh, uh, we're able to uh, uh, observe the, the uh, ultraviolet light from the liquid argon events by having a wavelength shifter on the inner, inner surface here that converts it to visible wavelengths to be measured in the experiment. Uh, the detector itself looks like this before it was closed up. And the first thing that we did after closing it up was to put in a resurfacer, basically a device with two rods with spinning sanding discs on the outside that rotated 360 degrees and sanded a half a, uh, a millimeter off the inner surface to get rid of any residual radioactivity and also the recoil products of that radioactivity, leaving us with just the bulk radioactivity in the acrylic, which had been very carefully controlled during manufacture. We get very nice signals from this detector. You can see here the advantage of using argon, which is that for nuclear recoils, you have in about roughly 10 nanoseconds, uh, all of the, uh, uh, well, the majority of the light emitted, as you can see in this case. Whereas for uh, things that produce electron recoils, it, it comes out over 10 microseconds or so. And so we take the ratio of the prompt light to the total light, which is the factor on this axis, F prompt as we call it, fraction that is prompt. And it enables us to distinguish electron recoils from things that have caused nuclear recoils, which include radioactivities that are quite high in energy and don't contribute very much to the low energy region here where we expect the weakly interacting mass of particles to exist. And you can see the nice separation between the two. Our region of interest is down here. We understand the radioactivity very well in the detector. This is what you observe as a spectrum of radioactivity uh, in, the, in the argon. It's dominated by argon 39, which is one becquerel per kilogram in this detector, but which is uh, uh, able to be discriminated very effectively by this pulse shape discrimination simply by taking that F prompt parameter, and it dominates, as you can see, the region down here. The rest of the spectrum that you see there, it's not a fit. It's actually our external measurements of all the radioactivities in the materials used to generate what we should expect to see, and what we should expect to see is exactly what we do see. So we do understand the radioactivity very well, including understanding how many neutrons are produced by the alpha end production in our phototubes and how well they're thermalized before they get to the detector. The pulse shape discrimination works extremely well. You can see here the fraction that gets through as a function of that parameter F prompt uh, is on the order of 10 to the minus nine at the 90% acceptance for nuclear recoils and about 10 to the minus 10 for 50% acceptance of nuclear recoils. We analyzed the first four days of data just to indicate how well the detector is running. And this is what you see here, no events in that uh, period of time. And that enabled us to set uh, which, what at the time was very similar to what uh, Darkside 50 had done with a smaller uh, amount of material. Uh, when we are finished of three years of counting, we expect a sensitivity down here, uh, very comparable to what has been observed already by Xenon 1 ton and Lux and Panda X, and not too far from what is expected, the ultimate uh, projection for Xenon 1 ton. Now, what we're really excited about these days is the potential for the future. Basically, all the scientists in the world who are working on liquid argon have come together in one collaboration. In particular, uh, Dark Side Deep, Mini Clean, and ARDM. And we are planning a sequence of experiments, starting with the Deep and Dark Side 50 experiments, but moving now to 20 tons of dark of argon at uh, Grand Sasso, and eventually we want to consider 300 tons at, uh, well, we hope Snow Lab. It's uh, the, uh, the statement in the letter of uh, intent is the best scientific location. 
strong support from the international laboratories involved. Uh, and uh, we plan uh, to, we are finalizing the design for the Dark Side 20K experiment uh, here uh, in Europe at uh, the Grand Sasso Laboratory. And it's strongly based on the uh, protodune technology that's being developed at CERN for the Dune experiment at Fermilab using uh, existing uh, modular technology for the transportation of liquid uh, natural gas, which I think uh, people here certainly had a significant involvement in, in putting forward in the first place, and uh, developing uh, uh, a uh, modular detector, something that's easy to, to uh, take underground. Uh, this is what exists at, uh, at Fermilab and, and is about to be cooled down. What we want to do is to take that structure uh, at the 20 ton fiducial scale, put in the middle here low radioactivity argon extracted from underground sources so that under argon 39 is strongly suppressed, surround it by atmospheric argon, and also put a veto shield around the outside to veto neutrons coming in from the outside and also neutrons that come from inner materials that would scatter out. That's what's being done right now. We hope to have that in operation by 2022 at Grand Sasso, and we're getting strong cooperation from CERN in doing that. The detector would be a two-phase detector in which we don't just depend upon the light output and those favorable properties for uh, discrimination of uh, dark matter versus uh, uh, electron recoils but also adds a uh, second phase where you drift uh, the simulation that occurs to a region where you get electroluminescence in the gas above the liquid and can get a good determination of position uh, using that information as well. That's already been run, of course, in the Dark Side 50 detector, and the data for that is on the right. They saw no background uh, in the uh, year or so of running. Um, they also used argon extracted from an underground site, and whereas this is the spectrum that you observe if you have atmospheric, well, argon that comes from the atmosphere, where argon-39 with a 300-year roughly half-life is produced at that level I mentioned, for the underground argon, it's at least a factor of 1,400 reduced. That argon came from a site in Colorado, which uh, uh, is now being exploited. Uh, tender is about to be let for uh, a uh, uh, extraction facility capable of doing 250 kilograms a day on the order of 90 tons a year in operation, which would be great for the 20 ton detector, but also has the capability in a four or five year period to produce enough for a 300 ton detector. It is purified, in this case, in a very long column uh, in a mine in Sardinia, uh, which you can see here, before it goes to Grand Sasso for use in the detector. That same column run at a lower rate has the capability of perhaps doing enrich enrichment of argon-39 by another factor of 10. The Residual argon-39 will be measured in a repurposing of ARDM at uh, the Confrank laboratory. And new technology has been developed that will give the uh, experiment uh, significant capabilities. Silicon photomultipliers are now being produced by an uh, Italian manufacturer. This is a, now a, a set of silicon photomultipliers with about the size of a three-inch diameter phototube that have really spectacular uh, single photoelectron resolution and also very good timing. And that uh, manufacturer is producing them for the 20-ton uh, uh, detector. It turns out the dark side experiment has not only uh, got good results in a high mass region, but also has the best results in the world right now for the low mass region below 
uh, 10 GeV or so, as you can see here with these red lines, the uncertainty here is the, uh, is the sensitivity uh, uh, to uh, the S2 signal, the electroluminescent signal, which is being used alone in this case. Uh, and, uh, and in this case, the ability to remove further argon-39 uh, with the uh, uh, facility in Sardinia is going to be helpful when it comes to trying to uh, move uh, further down. Uh, this is also a region that will be uh, accessed using the NEWS experiment that is uh, uh, being developed here at, uh, uh, at Saclay uh, by uh, collaborators of Gilles Gerbier and him. So, as a summary, in the high mass region, we are attempting to observe in the 20 ton detector the sensitivity uh, in this vicinity for cross section versus mass of the WIMP. We expect to be in this vicinity with the DEEP experiment, and we would like to go all the way to what's called the neutrino floor, uh, which is really defined by the fact that at some point you can't shield neutrinos, and at some point, therefore, you're going to end up with nuclear recoil, so coherent scattering from atmospheric neutrinos particularly. And at that point, actually, you have substantially higher sensitivity to solar neutrinos, which brings us full circle. It's particularly ironic for me to be working on an experiment where solar neutrinos are the background rather than the objective of the experiment. But anyway, that's the situation. Um, with argon, we think we can do factors of four or five better than xenon in terms of getting rid of the, uh, uh, the solar neutrinos because we've got this 10 to the ninth or so discrimination factor in argon. And uh, the best so far that's been done in xenon is on an order of a factor of 300 or so. And so we think that argon has significant advantages over xenon by the time you're trying to go all the way to the neutrino floor, and therefore we're gearing up to try to do that with this 300 ton detector that I, uh, uh, that I mentioned. And uh, so that, uh, and notice also, of course, that uh, we have sensitivity up in this region here, which is above the, the region that can be accessed by the Large Hadron Collider. So it's, uh, uh, for us, a very interesting future experiment. So in conclusions, uh, it's a thriving field. Uh, there's uh, uh, a number of underground laboratories that uh, provide excellent condition for these studies. And we're particularly interested in noble liquid detectors that we think have the capability of going all the way to the, no to the neutrino floor, particularly through the use of argon. Thank you very much. So thank you for this uh, wonderful seminar that has covered many of the most uh, fundamental questions of uh, contemporary physics. I'm sure that this has stimulated uh, uh, people here to... You, you, can blame, you can blame Marco. I said, I'll just talk about argon. He said, no, I'll talk about snow and so on too. So, so you, <laughs> okay. you got the firehouse. <laughs> okay. okay, so now it's open for questions. Indicate in any case. So. If you don't find s signal with a dark side experiment, does, what does it mean for dark matter? Um, well, it, it's a it's a very good question. What does it mean for all of us in terms of trying to understand <laughs> what the universe is composed of? Um, several things. One, uh, there is just the vestiges of some directional sensitivity in liquid argon that have come out of some of the uh, measurements that have been made so far, and that's clearly something we're going to be exploring further uh, in terms of trying to understand how to, uh, how to go uh, uh, beyond the neutrino floor. Um, experimentally, in the low mass region, uh, the hope is that the ability to remove more argon-39 using the 
area facility in Sardinia might, and particularly with a larger detector than the 50 ton, 50, 50 kilogram detector, dark side 50, that perhaps it's possible in the lower mass region to go further as is also being studied by news and, and, and uh, uh, super CDMS and so on. And there's quite a distance to go before the neutrino flow there. And there's many imaginative, I mean, as soon as you uh, have another puzzle that shows up as there is right now with, with the LHC also not seeing anything that could uh, represent dark matter, uh, the theorists uh, get busy, and so there's a, a large number of theories that say, well, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, not WIMPs, maybe it's something else, but it might be of particle nature, and those particles would interact differently, uh, potentially having masses down in the low mass region. There are theories that, uh, that propose that. Um, I think uh, it goes to the theorists' ballpark at the point where you don't see something experimentally. And right now what's happening is that theorists and experimentalists are exploring a wide variety of things to try to see if they can understand alternatives to WIMPs, everything from beam dump experiments to a wide variety of other things. So uh, uh, our, uh, we have a path that we think uh, we can follow for, uh, until I'm using a walker at least, probably beyond that, uh, just using argon, and, and so it's one path that we plan to pursue. Other questions? Yes, concerning the, the dark matter, what are still the chances that it is not uh, some unknown particles, but that, the, that it is, uh, for example, uh, black holes uh, that we have more than we expect in, in the galaxy? Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm clearly not an expert on, on, on that. Uh, I understand there is some possibility that primordial dark holes may make up a small fraction of what we currently put in the, uh, in the dark matter category. Uh, there are limits as to how much you could have in, uh, uh, in ordinary matter uh, behaving in the way that dark matter has to behave, uh, constrained by a wide variety of things, nucleosynthesis being one of them. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, 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 other leading candidate for dark matter are particles called axions, which have a theoretical motivation as being the, the particle associated with CP conservation in the strong interaction, and a whole variety of experiments uh, that are uh, approaching that, one of them being, for example, the CAST experiment at, uh, uh, at CERN that's looking at uh, uh, um, potential axions from uh, the sun, uh, pointing a magnet at the, the sun uh, at sunset and, uh, and sunrise uh, to look for conversion of such, uh, such axions in a uh, very high magnetic field from a prototype uh, CERN beam pipe. Uh, so there's, there's, it's a wonderful field. There's so many creative ways in which people are approaching such things. Axions are also predominantly studied in resonant cavities and uh, and it certainly is a very viable option. In the search for neutrino SW beta decay, how is, are you positioned compared to uh, other experiments in Europe or in China? Um, <coughs> we're late compared to uh, a number of the experiments. Uh, Quare experiment is a, a really beautiful example in, in Europe using the same uh, isotope as we're using, tellurium-130. Uh, um, we think we will have a little bit better sensitivity ultimately than Quare because of the alpha surface uh, background events, that uh, alphas on the surface of the crystals that are a limitation in the, in the Quare experiment. If our projections are right in terms of our backgrounds, we should be able to do uh, somewhat better than what will eventually limit them uh, in terms of sensitivity, but not a long ways beyond that. And of course, the Cupid experiment, which is being developed to look at light emission as well as bolometry uh, in tellurium-130, would address that background problem. So uh, uh, from that point of view, uh, uh, that's a way of next generation quarry to try to uh, 
approach the topic. So we're, we're in the middle of the pack in terms of uh, sensitivity and uh, Quarry is the main competitor for Tellurium. So in, the, in Snow Lab, you mean you have many experiments all linked to having uh, very, very low background rates. Um, nothing related to uh, 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 neutrino and accelerators. So I was wondering whether uh, very low background uh, labs could be an advantage for an accelerator neutrino uh, experiment. Accelerator-based ex neutrino experiments. <coughs> um, it's, it's, it, it the energies of the events that you're looking at are uh, so far above natural radioactivity that there isn't a tremendous advantage in the primary measurements that you're trying to make with accelerators. Um, on the other hand, many of these experiments that uh, um, are, produce, are, are proposing very, very large detectors, um, both the dune detectors and uh, eventually uh, hyper K detectors and so on, have other potential uses, and uh, you know among among them uh, things like uh, uh, solar neutrino measurements and so on. Uh, particularly if they're deep enough to to be able to do that, and uh, uh, the liquid argon detectors, for example, for Dune uh, would have that capability if they're manufactured cleanly enough to avoid the type of radioactivity problems I was describing. So it's not for the primary objective, but for secondary objectives that you. Uh, would want to do that. Okay. And what about the Snow Lab program about geoneutrinos? It seems to me that the low background is a very good thing, the geoneutrino studies. Yeah. Well, once we have scintillator in, uh, then we have a, a, a nice uh, opportunity to uh, study geoneutrinos, even during the double beta decay running, um, because it's a coincidence, uh, as you know, uh, anti-neutrinos, uh, anti-electron neutrinos that produce a coincidence between a, uh, you know, a, a proton and, and an electron event. And uh, so we would expect to have, uh, you know, respectable sensitivity in a new location, it's under the Canadian shield, which is a very thick crust. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, I mean, the people who want to do uh, uh, underwater measurements off Hawaii often say that if you had one that was just crust and one that was just mantle, or combine the two, then uh, maybe you could sort things out better. But I think we'll learn a lot by the combination of mantle plus crust that you get at uh, Boroxino and at uh, and at Camland, and a measurement that's predominantly crust uh, in uh, in Canada. We're sufficiently far from reactors that we can get a signal from the reactors, but it's not as dominant as it is, for example, in Camland. And so, from that point of view, uh, we think we can get a, a fairly robust signal there. Okay, maybe last question. <laughs> uh, what about uh, relic uh, not supernova neutrino? C can you expect, uh, it is uh, isotropes, so maybe it's very difficult to detect, but do you expect to have the sensitivity one day to detect them? It's difficult, uh, as you know. We're actually, uh, we have a group of people who are continuing to analyze snow data uh, even, you know, we stopped running at the end of 2006, but uh, uh, there's information there. We never did the uh, relic uh, supernova neutrinos for all three phases of the project, and, and that analysis is just about finished, and within the next year, we'll probably have an analysis uh, of that. But it won't be, you know, it'll be a factor of two or so more than, uh, uh, than where we are right now. I think the best prospect for observing uh, relic supernova neutrinos is the Super Cameo Candy experiment with gadolinium added. And of course, that's exactly what they're doing now. And once they get gadolinium in it, then they'll have a, a very nice potential signal there. And its size combined with the added 
sensitivity by putting the gadolinium in will will give them a good opportunity, I think, maybe to see something finite. Okay, let us uh, thank uh, the Professor McDonald again. Thank you.